Our sermon this evening will be based on Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29, but we'll read the whole chapter together first. Uh, but let us pray now for God to illuminate the scriptures to us by the power of his Spirit. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we still our hearts before you now as we approach your word. And we know that we're not worthy to hear you speak to us graciously as our Father and as our Savior. And yet that is how your word comes to us as your people. So Lord, we pray that you would grant us soft and receptive hearts to your word. And we pray that as we look at the Apostle Paul's ministry and his description of his ministry and his sufferings and his love for the church and his concern for the body of Christ, that all of us might be stirred to love you more and to seek to serve you with more energy, and faith. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, 
for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Amen. And this is the word of the one true and living God. This is our fourth sermon now on Colossians chapter one. And we've been going through this chapter quite slowly and deliberately slowly because there's so much in it. In our first sermon, we looked on verses 1 to 8, and we studied Paul's prayer for the faithfulness and the fruitfulness of this church plant in Colossae. In the second sermon, we saw Paul's summary of the gospel in how these Christians in Colossae have been delivered from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the beloved Son. And this morning we looked at Paul's description of the supremacy and the preeminence of Christ as the image of the invisible God and the firstborn from the dead and the reconciler of all things to himself. And now we come at the end of this chapter to Paul's description of his ministry and his calling and his motives and his sufferings and his purpose in preaching Christ. And in this letter, Paul's description of his ministry and his willingness to suffer and his call to suffer for the gospel, it supports his overall exhortation to the church not to drift away from the gospel, not to be taken in by the hollow deceptive philosophy or the Jewish legalism and asceticism, but to stand fast, immovable in the gospel. And so Paul sets before the church this description of his ministry. And it is a model for us tonight of Christian service, of Christian obedience, done in faith, suffering in faith for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we study these verses, 29, sorry, 24 to 29 of Colossians chapter one, we'll do so in three points. Calling Christ and conclusion. Calling Christ and conclusion. What was the nature of Paul's calling? The Christ that he proclaimed, the mystery that he proclaimed will be our second point. And then our third point will be, well, what was his purpose? What was his goal? What was his end? What was the conclusion of it all? Calling Christ and conclusion. Let's look then at our first point, which is calling and read verses 24 and 25 together where Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul says that he can rejoice in his sufferings. That is not normal. It is not normal to rejoice in your sufferings. But there's one instance where a person could rejoice in their sufferings. Think of a mother going into labor to give birth to her child. And although it is a suffering, it's painful, there is joy that a new life is on the way into the world. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself, for the joy that was set before him, went to the cross. For the joy that was set before him in redeeming his people, he went to suffer and to die on a cross. 
Paul says that he can rejoice in his sufferings as he suffers to preach the gospel and to build up the church because the word of the gospel is going out, taking root in people's hearts and new life is coming into the world through his suffering and ministry. He tells the church in Colossae that this is for you. Paul is writing as the apostle to the Gentiles, so although he has never physically met, been in this church in Colossae and met these particular Christians, he's able to write about his apostolic ministry to the church. He does it for them, for Christ's body, as it says in verse 24, for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul's love for the church is rooted in his love for Christ because he knows the one who met him on the Damascus road and the one who saved him from everlasting torments in hell as a persecutor of God's people. He loves Christ. He loves Christ's church and so he is prepared to suffer in his body for the sake of the church. He says that he is willing to fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What does that mean? There is no lack at all in the redemptive sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his active and passive obedience and his death on the cross, perfectly, completely, and totally soaked in and soaked up all the wrath of God against the sins of his people. So there's no lack in the redemptive sufferings. So how can Paul fill up in his flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ? Paul is willing for his feet to beat a Roman road in the scorching heat and to bleed, for him to suffer in innumerable ways so that he can take the word of the gospel to God's elect. He is willing to fill up in his flesh that suffering, the suffering that must be undertaken to bring the word of God to the people of God. And he says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. It's described as a stewardship. He's entrusted with a particular responsibility as the apostle to the Gentiles to show the riches of the glories of the mystery of redemption in Jesus Christ. And this was given to him for you, he says. It is for your benefit. It is for the church's benefit, but it is on God's terms. And so that is his calling as a minister to serve the church, but on God's terms. His calling is to fulfill the word of God or to make the word of God fully known. In the Greek, it has the connotations of either executing an office in the sense of fulfilling a task, a purpose, a mission, or to cram to the fullness in the sense of filling up a net, to make the word of God fully known. Calvin, in his commentary on this passage, highlights that what Paul is drawing attention to is the efficacy of this knowledge of God, the efficacy of his ministry in making fully known the word of God. And given what comes next in verse 26 about the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints, we can see that Paul's calling was to preach the whole counsel of God. That that knowledge of God might go out and be taken in by all of God's people. What are the applications for us? Well, one application is to recognize that there is still work to be done in building up the church. 
there is still suffering to be undertaken in building up the church and in the practicalities of sharing the word of God. And we must be prepared to undertake that as each of us are called to do so by our Lord Jesus Christ. We also recognize in this passage that Paul loves the church because he loves Christ. And the church is Christ's body. And we must see things the same way. If we're ever tempted to not view the church in that way, this passage rebukes us. And it shows us how Paul loves the church because he loves Christ. And the church is Christ's body. And as counterintuitive as it is, we, as the Lord's people, can rejoice in our sufferings as we serve because they are helping our brothers and our sisters to grow in Christ. We are called to serve on God's terms. It is for his body, but it is stewardship. The message is Christ. There is a particular message that Paul was entrusted to preach, and so he preached it. And each of us will be entrusted with particular gifts and talents that we are called to steward for the glory of God and in service to our Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. We are called to serve on God's terms as stewards of that which has been entrusted to us. For Paul, it was the calling to be a minister of the gospel and to proclaim Christ. And this leads us to our second point, which is Christ. Let's read together verses 26 and 27. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, that the Messiah, the Son of God, would be pierced for our transgressions. God willed to make known what are the riches of this glory among the Gentiles. It was his will. It was his intention to display the riches of his redemptive love, majesty, and glory among the Gentiles, not only to Israel, but all the earth, all the nations. And beyond that, if we remember our complementary reading in Ephesians chapter three, it says in Ephesians three verses eight to 11, Paul writes, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the glory of God is manifest to principalities and powers in the heavenly places by the witness of the church. Because the disciples suffered to proclaim Christ and the gospel went out and the word of God took root and began to grow and to bear fruit in the lives of those who heard it. And so it was transmitted from generation to generation and generation. And that word that was sown in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is now being preached here in Newcastle. The glory of God is manifest to principalities and powers in the heavenly places by the witness of the church. The flickering light of the grace of God, when a congregation of saints gather on the Lord's day to sing praise unto his name, 
and to submit themselves to his word, the witness of God's redemptive glory goes out to the world and up even to heaven, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And it is Christ in you that you are conformed to his likeness, that you as an individual with your personality and your gifts are conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ through the indwelling power of his Holy Spirit. And so we have the hope of glory, that the light of everlasting life shines in you, shines in us, and points to the resurrection of the dead through your transformation, through the change that God has worked in your heart and your life, the hope of glory shines. Christ in you, eternal life in you, resurrection life in you. Let's draw some applications for ourselves. We should remember that we only know the gospel because it has been revealed to us. On one level, this is because God will to reveal it. God from eternity past set his love upon you and will to show you, to open your eyes to the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing in you. There was nothing that you could have done. It was all of his grace. God from eternity willed that you would behold the glory in Christ. But it came to you as well through those who shared it to you, shared it with you maybe a family member, a parent, a grandparent, a friend at school. You saw Christ laid before your eyes in the scripture and your eyes were opened. We only know the gospel because it has been revealed to us by God's grace. And we should remember that it is Christ in us, that we are being conformed to his likeness, and it is his spirit that dwells within us and prompts us to say no to temptation and leads us to know the good that we ought to do. His spirit dwells within us and brings us into conformity to his likeness and his image. And so we should remember then the hope of glory and let that shine through in our lives. When we make decisions that others in our family or in our friendship circles that can't, they can't quite seem to understand. But it's because we are living our lives in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and because we have the hope of glory. That leads us then to our third point, which is conclusion. What was Paul doing this work for? What was it all leading to? What would it culminate in? Let's read verses 28 and 29 together. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. What is Paul's goal? Well, we see it there in verse 29. To this end, I also labor. It is to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 28. Paul begins by thinking about the end. What is the end? What is the goal? It's to present every man perfect perfect in Christ Jesus. When will he do this? When will this happen? When will they be presented the last day? On the day of judgment when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in his glory with the angels 
and calls all people to account. Paul knows that he will be called to account. And those saints that he has ministered to, those people whom have been entrusted to his care and to his stewardship as a minister of the gospel, he will be called to account for how he has ministered. And so his hope and his longing is to present every one of them perfect in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, we, him, we preach because this is the desire of all of Christ's servants in the ministry. As Paul says to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter four and verse one, you are my joy and crown. You are my joy and crown. The congregations that Paul had helped to plant and the Christians whom Paul had helped to encourage and build up in the faith, he says to them, you are my crown. It's the people. So he warns and he teaches. It's a positive work to be done, which is the teaching of the word of God. And there's the negative work to be done, which is to do the warning and to say, no, that's not right. There's the teaching and the warning. And it's to be done in all wisdom. Matthew Henry in his commentary writes on this passage about the practical wisdom that's needed in the work of the ministry, when to broach certain topics and so on. But also in the context of this letter, we know how the Colossians were seeking after other forms of wisdom and higher forms of wisdom and wisdom beyond the Christian gospel that they thought they could find. And Paul is saying, no, all wisdom. We teach and we warn in all wisdom. There's no other wisdom to be found that can see of you. Him we preach. It's a person at the center. It's Christ at the center. The Savior who gave his life. Him we preach. He is the one who is exalted and lifted high and described and magnified through the preaching of the word. Him we preach. And Paul describes this as labor and striving. In the Greek, actually, the word is closely related to our word for agony. Labor and striving but it's according to God's working. And it is God who works this energy into Paul as a servant of Christ, as a minister of the gospel. And this energy is mighty in him. The might of the God who parted the Red Sea and called down plagues on Egypt is the one who empowers Paul to preach freedom from bondage in the Lord Jesus Christ to preach that you can be brought from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son. Let's draw some applications for ourselves. First question is to ask, what is the goal of your life? What is the goal of your life? Are you striving for the gospel, for the spread of the gospel, for the glory of Christ, for the building up and edification of his body? Or is it something else? When you are striving for the gospel, it is God's grace in your life that enables you to do that. When you are striving for the gospel, it is God's work in you. And so this evening, as we draw to a close, and as we've looked at Paul's description of his ministry and his willingness to fill up in himself and in his flesh that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, 
we know that he was willing to do it because of his great love for Christ, which gave him a great love for Christ's body, which is the church. And all of us have the opportunity now to examine ourselves and to ask, well, what is the goal of my life? What am I striving for? What do I pour my energies into? Where am I investing my time? What thrills and excites me when I see myself progressing in that area of my life? Is it the work of the church? Is it the glory of Christ? Is it the glory of Almighty God, the creator and the sustainer of all things who is at work now, this day, to redeem his people and to conform them, to conform us into the likeness of his son so that these flickering lights of God's grace, of gospel witness, might grow stronger and stronger and stronger and grow into a flame that will light this country up with the hope of glory, which is Christ in us. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we're humbled to read of Paul's ministry, his willingness to suffer for the sake of the church. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to have the same mindset. And we repent of our own feelings. Father, we pray that that would come to pass that the hope of glory, Christ in us, that witness might grow stronger and stronger in each of our lives, that it might shine brighter and brighter, and that it might be a powerful draw to those around us who are perishing in their sin, that light and life is found in Jesus Christ. Father, please do whatever needs to be done in our hearts that we would be willing to suffer for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Let us stand to sing hymn number 263, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.